So, I guess we should be starting. Um, so, I have the pleasure today to uh, present to you Brian Yassel, who will give a lecture on migration, the na a narrative method in American climate fiction. Uh, and Marie Mai was, has a PhD defense, so she was not able uh, to make it, so I took over the duty. Uh, and this is something I'm doing with great pleasure, uh, because um, Brian is a newcomer to Diaz in the way he arrived in Diaz in 2019. But uh, already the, the, the years before, he was a postdoc at SDU uh, at the Nils Bohr Professorship, the Uses of Literature. Uh, led by professors and uh, Rita Felsky and Anne Marie May, where I also have a small stake. So I've had the pleasure of working together with Brian for the last couple of years and hopefully also the years ahead. Uh, so Brian holds a PhD in English from University of California Davis from 2016. Uh, he is a <coughs> literature scholar but uh, with an overall interest in the links between literature, public policy and welfare policies. Uh, his uh, doctoral thesis was about vagrancy, uh, studying how this kind of salient social problem around the turn of the last century uh, and the relationship between the social problem, the interpretation of the social problem and uh, more popular narratives. I mean, if you think about the vagrant around the turn of the century, the image of Charles, uh, Charles uh, Chaplin, for instance, uh, quite easily comes to mind. Uh, in his more recent project, uh, and, and he has published on this in a number of uh, articles, uh, uh, book chapters, and I think there's also a full book manuscript uh, on the way uh, will be forthcoming. In more recently, Brian have been uh, studying uh, the migration, science fiction, and climate change. So the links between the three, uh, I'll not say anything about that. That will actually be the topic for uh, today's uh, lecture. Uh, and I think, I mean, the choice of topics uh, tells you the story about Brian being a literature scholar with a, uh, say, a very cross-disciplinary mindset in many ways, so interested in what is going on in <clears throat> different neighboring disciplines. Uh, he's also uh, at the moment involved in a project uh, studying how social science actually use literature as a fictional literature and uh, these different uses and discussions about, about that using together with people from history and, and, and social science. So um, I think we can look forward to an interesting uh, cross-disciplinary uh, lecture taking up some of the major topics uh, in discussions about today's society and the society of the future. So migration, uh, science fiction and climate change. Uh, but uh, I think uh, that should be enough talk from me. I mean, we should rather give the word to Brian, or give the screen to Brian, I guess would be the right uh, term in these days. So Brian, uh, the word is yours. Thanks for the um, really kind uh, introduction, Klaus. And um, uh, as, as Klaus mentioned, I have been at Diaz for um, about a year now, but this is the first uh, opportunity I've had just due to disruptions in the summer break in between to really present some of my research um, to you all. So I really look forward to, to doing so and to um, getting some feedback and maybe establishing the basis for future collaboration or exchange of ideas on this topic. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Um, there we go. So, yes, my um, talk today is going to be on migration and narrative method in American climate fiction. And um, as I was approaching this topic and how to best um, deal with it with a sort of mixed audience of, of experts, I think it best to start with a, a bit of an overview of the genre of fiction and, and then introducing some of my specific research interests in relation to it. Um, and then hopefully we'll have time for questions at the end to really maybe um, pick over some particular issues that maybe I otherwise don't have time to, to get into. So I'm going to start with a pretty basic statement about the future and migration, which is that the future experts can attest is one consisting of larger and larger populations of migrant people. Um, just to cite one source, uh, Ollie Brown writes that since the 1990s, essentially, there's been a consensus among scientists about the impact of climate change on human migration. And as he cites here, the most widely repeated prediction for the population of climate refugees, as they're often called, is around 200 million by the year 2050. 
though some estimates are lower than that and some are as high as a billion people. 200 million is a bit of a, a ballpark um, consensus. So already we have a pretty dramatic claim um, about the future and the climate refugees that will make up that future. And one that's, as I said, essentially agreed upon among experts and scientists in the field. But already I think you can anticipate that there's a gap between this fact and consensus and how it might be appreciated among um, the public. So for me, I focus mostly on the US. And I, I, yeah, I don't think I, I need to convince anyone that within the US, there doesn't seem to be much, much appreciation of uh, the steps that might meet, need to be taken in order to um, offset the worst effects of a giant influx of climate migrate, uh, excuse me, climate migrants. And in fact, there's already evidence of climate migration happening in the US. Hurricane Katrina, for example, displaced um, many people from the New Orleans area who settled permanently in other states. But uh, despite all these facts, there doesn't seem to be much happening. And part of the problem, I think, is safe to say, is that it's really hard to imagine what this future will look like. Although, of course, migration is a familiar phenomenon, uh, the scale is truly unprecedented in terms of what the scientists are describing here. So it's hard to maybe make policy changes or vote in um, politicians who might address this problem without being able to imagine this problem. And as a literary scholar, I think this is really interesting and exciting because it points to a role that maybe literature can play in informing people and fleshing out this, this imaginary, which up to this point has been maybe lacking. Oops. Yes. So in fact, uh, fiction has kind of risen to the occasion to a certain degree to address this problem and specifically talk about climate change and its societal consequences. In particular, um, you might have heard of this particular genre called climate fiction or, or cli-fi as it's often called, which over the last several years has been um, the subject of a lot of conversation both within the academy for literary scholars, but also for um, I think readers more generally and um, popular publications like New York Times, New Yorker, NPR, these types of things. Climate fiction, to give you a basic definition, is something you can think of along the lines of science fiction, where it's typically set in the future, or maybe the near future or far future, though it um, doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, but the difference is that these texts focus specifically on the changes that climate change will bring to society. And they typically focus on individual characters or families or communities that are struggling to adapt to climate change. And I think it's also worth pointing out though, that although um, science fiction you know, as long as it's existed, it's talked about extreme weather or planets with different climates. What distinguishes climate fiction is that it understands climate change as anthropogenic, human-driven, and the consequences therefore are, are sort of um, uh, more dealt with in terms of people dealing with their hitherto lack of attention to this problem. And as I uh, suggested, it's been, pretty recognized for its potential benefits to readers in terms of influencing their thoughts about climate change. Just to give you a sense here, I have just some headlines I pulled from, as I said, the New York Times, New Yorker, um, and The Guardian. And the language here is striking, as it says in one case, could this genre help save the planet? Uh, in another case, people ask, can climate change fiction or cli-fi force us to confront nothing less than the incipient death of the planet? And then there was a, a round table at the New York Times um, a couple of years ago now around the, the potential for this genre to influence people's opinions and in turn maybe enact larger change in terms of political movements and that sort of thing. So uh, just to reiterate, this isn't something that only exists for academics, but um, has been taken up, I think, by the press uh, at large. But of course, although there are a lot of uh, claims about what climate fiction might do, is there any evidence that it actually does affect people's behavior? Uh, it's a worthwhile question. And uh, thankfully, there's been some research to um, pursue this influence or potential influence. To name one example recently, Matthew Schneider Mayerson conducted a survey of climate fiction readers and tried to determine to what extent the genre 
uh, influence their worldview and might inspire them to take change to, to make changes in their behavior and maybe political orientation if possible. And on the good side of things, you might say there was some evidence that in terms of low level presentations of climate change and its consequences, Schneider Meyerson found that um, these presentations have found to lead to a higher level of concern and uh, stronger, um, stronger intentions to engage in uh, behaviors to mitigate climate change. Um, and low level is the operative term here, uh, I should say. So um, in terms of uh, thinking about individual behavior, how climate change might affect oneself or one's loved ones, Schneider Meyerson found people were very concerned and the actions they took were also what you might call immediate or low level. So people in the survey talked about how after reading climate fiction, they may be more inclined to use less plastic when they go to the grocery store, um, maybe do more recycling at home, that sort of thing. So very immediate personal individual actions. At the same time, uh, less optimistically, um, surveyed readers, he found, also tend to associate their feelings or emotional response to climate fiction um, in intensely negative terms. So people tend to relate their feelings that um, uh, they despair for the future after reading these texts. And because they have this strong emotional reaction, they actually tend to get the sense that there's nothing that can really be done on a collective or public level to address climate change. And so it has this interesting effect of encouraging, the, encouraging readers to act individually, but then also um, really seeing no outlet to channel that individual action into uh, more collective behavior and change, whether it be political um, or otherwise. So the conclusion he reaches is that if we take climate fiction to be a genre that wants to influence people, which I think it does, and to make them maybe change their habits, which I take it as doing that, it may only be as successful as the dominant cultural messages about meaningful environmental activities that are in circulation. So in other words, people bring their prejudice about uh, the world or society, their cultural um, intuitions or archetypes, and these texts don't so much challenge them as in some cases affirm them. And so if they don't think that the government or political actors can really do anything, these texts aren't gonna change their mind. So, that's a, a bit of a, of a recap of the, the genre and some of its important questions. And um, I just wanna give you a sense of what I'm interested in doing to build on this pre-existing research. In particular, I'm interested, uh, as Klaus mentioned, in migration and specifically climate migration. And so I think it's important to supplement maybe these large accounts of climate fiction in general with specific questions about how it might not necessarily influence people's thoughts about climate change as a universal phenomenon, but specific issues related to that. So maybe not how you're gonna to act to prevent climate change or offset it, but how you might um, deal with specific groups like climate migrants, what laws might be passed in order to accommodate them, um, that sort of thing. And as Schneider Meyerson also pointed out, if people bring to these texts a pre-existing um, sense of cultural norms and uh, archetypes, it's important, I think, to understand as a literary scholar, how these types might already be embedded in these texts, and in other cases, how they might be revised or subverted in different senses. So, if we think of science fiction as something that really expands our imagination, we may be surprised to learn that when it comes to climate fiction on the subject of climate migration, there's actually a very limited scale in terms of how they present climate migrants and where they circulate. As a lot of critics have pointed out who deal with climate uh, fiction, there tends to be an abiding focus in um, the global north, we might say, Europe, white America, Britain, Scandinavia, on a specific white familiar ethnic group. So although climate migrants span the world and uh, climate change obviously is a global phenomenon, the characters and central focuses of these texts still are the same familiar people that you might expect novels to have always talked about in these areas. So it's not really updating its demographic focus in that sense. Along similar lines, these texts tend to focus on very familiar and I think culturally rich and embedded spaces. So Los Angeles and New York City in, in the US context, of course, are uh, writ large across a lot of climate 
fiction. And again, these are areas that have, I think, strong cultural connotations in many senses. And so again, rather than expand the picture to deal with maybe far-flung locales, um, climate fiction tends to focus on very familiar um, embedded ones culturally. And the other point is worth raising that in relation to climate migration, these texts tend to ignore or exclude or otherwise don't really focus very much on what we might call real climate migrants. So again, I think the post-Katrina um, case might be the most obvious one, but related to the point about ethnocentrism, the climate migrants in these texts tend to be um, either based on past precedents, as I'll get into, or um, they're overwhelmingly sort of just white people in their presentation. So um, although they, they might be on the fringes of these narratives, the real climate migrant parallel is, is otherwise absent. But having said all that, uh, I want to stress that I'm not interested in just uh, wagging the finger, I think, so to speak, at climate fiction or climate fiction authors. I'm not interested in, in necessarily just pointing out that this is a, a failure um, to write good climate fiction. But I, I see this as a part of a, a larger narrative strategy about how they might use imaginative failure as a way to still generate concern about um, groups of people. And so in order to make this claim in my research, I'm interested in treating climate fictions as uh, practitioners of a type of sociology. And I'm stressing the fact that they're practitioners because often for literary critics, when we talk about sociology, it's about our own critical tools, how we can bring sociological methods to a text and, and read it along those lines. But the distinction I'm making here is that these narratives, I think, uh, present the world along sociological terms and in that sense are performing a type of sociology. And I can elaborate on this, of course, in the next few minutes. Um, for me, I think the foundational account of sociology that C. Wright Mills offers is really important because as he points out in the Sociological Imagination, which was published in 1959, um, it's important for sociologists to consider the limits of uh, a public imagination in ways that don't just foreclose future action. So to point out that people don't really see themselves as part of a larger group is insane, um, you know, collective action is impossible, but rather the sociologist should make one's embeddedness in that group apparent to them, and in doing so, that might open the door for this person or individual to, to think collectively and act collectively in the future. And so I argue that the lack or, or failure of representation in climate fiction when it comes to migration um, may not be a problem so much as it is a strategy to sort of link uh, personal effects of migration and the popular understanding of it to maybe a, a wider sense of public responsibility. So just to give you a sense of what I mean by imaginative lack of climate mi migration and, and climate fiction, as I've already hinted at, um, there are some trends that extend across texts. The first one being that climate migrants in these, in these stories are usually based on very popular and again, culturally uh, rich archetypes. The two most prevalent ones being in my findings, um, the Dust Bowl farmer from the Great Depression who travels from basically the east of the US to the west. And again, these are also largely understood as white um, people. So that's I think also part of what it might do for these authors. The other archetype being the uh, Central American or Mexican a uh, migrant who moves north across the border. And so in so many cases, you see these stories where that is the sort of paradigm for understanding migration into the future. And often it's very common in these stories that Americans are put in the position of, you know, the, the, the Central American where they're trying to cross the border going north into Canada. And then Canada typically builds a wall and tries to push Americans out. So um, these, these frames of reference are dominant across a number of climate fiction texts when they talk about migration. The other aspect of imaginative lack that I'm interested in is how often these novels and stories talk about and focus on characters whose imaginations fail them in really explicit ways. And so often you have characters who just can't adapt to the new world that climate change has wrought, either because they are from a previous generation or their way of thinking is from an outdated frame of reference. And so they fail in so many respects to survive. 
And there's a lot of examples of this, but I just want to give you one from uh, Paolo Bacigalupi's novel, The Water Knife, which takes place in the Southwest US that's suffering from drought. Uh, and a character, oops, who is a climate migrant, explains why she essentially betrays this other character. And she says, she, meaning her friend, thinks the world is supposed to be one way, but it's not, it's already changed. And she can't see it because she only sees how it used to be before when things were old. And so in very explicit ways, these characters are grappling themselves with um, their own ability or others inability to imagine the future. And so in this sense, it's really making it apparent to the readers, I would argue. And then, and this is most important for reading these texts as a form of sociology, I argue that this in text, these narrative focus on imaginative failures or lacks is meant to extend from the page, what's happening to these characters, to the reader of these texts. That these novels want us to think about our own imaginative inability to consider climate migration, but still think about what might come after, after this, this gap. To give you an example of this, and this is a, a really explicit one, Kim Stanley Robinson, who is probably the most prominent, um, um, critically praised science fiction author in the US at the present, wrote a climate fiction novel, New York 2140, that involves New York City 200 years or so, 120 years in the future, half submerged by water due to the melting ice cap. And at one point while describing the disaster that this extreme weather is bringing to the city, the narrator stops and addresses the, the reader very explicitly and points out that what's happening in New York isn't isolated. And in fact, there's even more extreme cases in other places in the globe. As it points out here, two months later, Beijing was buried in 40 feet of lowest dust, sweeping down on winds from the Northwest. Did you hear? Can you imagine? Worse than water by far. Want to hear all about it? No. Ease of representation, which strikes us most strongly seems more widespread than it really is. So back to New York, which is after all where baseball was invented. So I think in very, you know, a very a sense of um, comedy, I guess you could say, the narrator is making it clear that although it's focusing on a very familiar setting, New York City, it's not necessarily an accident. And the author is very knowingly sort of reproducing the reader's assumptions about where migration happens and what city matters in a global sense in order to maybe gesture to other places in the world. I think it's helpful to read Kim Stanley Robinson alongside, again, C. Wright Mills, and to, to understand the sociological understanding that Robinson brings to his text. Just to reiterate, Mills argues that the sociological imagination is meant to help individuals understand the larger historical scene that kind of defines or shapes their everyday life. The problem is that individuals, due to just the repetition or daily welter, as he puts it, of their lives and experience, become falsely conscious of their social positions. People tend to take things for granted or they, um, they are blind to their relationship to the public and so they only understand phenomena in the most personal terms and struggle to make the connection between the personal and the public. And so for Mills, again, uh, sociology shouldn't ideally transform this indifference or an ability to imagine one's connection to the public into a greater awareness and um, ideally greater involvement with public issues. And I think this is very um, basically what climate fiction is trying to do. But in this case, it's making imaginative failure as, uh, as, a, as a sort of obstacle to collective action, the subject of scrutiny with the hope, I think, of trying to encourage people to look beyond it or even act at the same time. Um, so just to, to wrap up some of the implications of imaginative failures, this is a topic that I want to expand upon um, in the future. So um, I'm very um, receptive to any comments or feedback you have on, on how it can be applied. But I just want to stress that this approach, I think, differs from how a lot of literary critics tend to focus on science fiction. When people in literature tend to write about science fiction, they stress texts that are really successful at um, diverse representations. So ones that kind of break the the, the ethnocentric uh, uh, mold or tend to focus on other places outside of the global north, 
And I think those are obviously very important texts, but I do think that is a gap between the way literary scholars focus on science fiction and the way readers might take in science fiction. As I said, the, the example of Ken Stanley Robinson, um, he's very um, popular in that field and he understands, I think, pretty, pretty explicitly the need to maybe address readers with a more limited um, cultural uh, scope. As I pointed out, I want to understand these failures as not just uh, negative in terms of what they leave out, but how they might generate political action or concern. And that relates to my last big question that I'm still researching and, and looking into, which is the implication in these texts is that climate change obviously isn't something that's going to wait for people's understanding of it. It's not something that um, even at this point people can turn around, even if everyone agreed it was necessary to do so. So I think climate fiction at a certain level understands that action is probably more important than understanding, if that makes sense. And so I'm interested what I'm interested in um, what uh, what it might mean to act with an imperfect imagination, if that is where, where that might lead, what that might look like. Climate fiction doesn't often show us roadmaps for successful action. Typically, climate fiction is about failure, as I point out. That ends with people who have no options left and they're just on a post-apocalyptic landscape. So they're not texts that typically give us a, a blueprint for how to fix things. It leaves that really open. So I'm interested in what comes after this imagine of failure. And as Klaus pointed out, and I wanted to, to reiterate this too, I'm also interested in connecting the way social theory might circulate within fiction to more, I think, concrete examples of sociology. So we are conducting a survey of social scientists, Klaus, myself, Paul Marx, and uh, Patrick Fessenbecker being our colleagues on the survey, which was sent out to um, the top 25 universities. And um, uh, so far we have 900 responses uh, talking about social scientists who use literature or, or may not use literature in their own work. And uh, we're at the process of reviewing this and hopefully uh, I'll talk to you alongside Klaus in the future about our findings uh, in that area. But um, I think that's that's all I have for, for now. Uh, if you're interested in, in more of this, this uh, argument I have for climate fiction, um, an article based on this presentation has just been published uh, recently, as you can see in the bottom here. So um, I encourage you to, to, look at it, to look at it or I can send it to you. And I'm very dry in the mouth now from talking, so I'm, I'm willing to listen now to questions. So thank you, Brian, uh, for, your, for your lecture. Uh, inside in the genre of cli-fi. Uh, so the, we have about 15-20 uh, minutes uh, for people to have comments, questions. Uh, so I think I should be able to see the ones who raise hands, otherwise they will have to signal interest uh, other ways. Uh, Oh, oh, I kind of lost my way into it. Here we go. Saran has his hand up. Uh, I cannot see anybody, but maybe it's because, oh yeah, so Saran, so uh, because I did something wrong here. Saran, so yes, please. Okay, thank you, Klaus. Uh, thank you, Brian, for, for a very interesting talk, a really fascinating topic. Um, I'm, I, I, a, a question and a suggestion. Uh, since you also was kind enough to share your literature list uh, at the far end, um, I'm I'm uh, I'm curious about your notion of 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 imperfect or limited imaginations, mm. uh, because if I try to inverse it, uh, what would what would be a perfect or unlimited imagination? Um, uh, and so so I'm not sure what what type of imagination. Uh, you are talking about uh, that 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 can be qualified <coughs> as imperfect or limited, uh, or at least I think you need some further qualifications to these mm -hmm. qualifications in order for that to be to be meaningful. Uh, yeah, that's that's a I mean a, a very important point um, clearly, and I guess for me um, being I coming from a literature background, uh, as I sort of suggested towards the end, I think typically when people look to what science fiction or climate fiction can do in terms of have a social impact, I think 
critics would tend to stress its capacity to kind of break binaries, to imagine more diverse futures. So they're not necessarily perfect. They're not utopian, but they would say, you know, the best versions of this would be ones that um, just show sort of global expanse of climate change, for example, and show how people all across the world are connected along this global phenomenon in ways that just kind of break the, um, the, the cultural norms that otherwise exist, if that makes sense. So that kind of radical subversion of, of archetypes, um, I would say that's, that's, that tends to be what critics stress. And so I'm sort of posing that um, it's possible to see climate fiction not necessarily doing that as far as representation, but also still contributing to the work of generating concern, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. So, so, I, so, so yeah, so it's a non-reductionist or kind of a, a, an opening and, and you know, uh, kind of an inclusive, a, a, an imagination that is more inclusive than, than, than you know, narrowing perspective. Yeah, that's, that, I think that, that's a good way of putting it. So yeah, maybe perfect and imperfect isn't the best uh, uh, binary, but more inclusive or, or, or lacking. I, uh, I have a suggestion for, maybe uh, you're familiar with the book, but uh, 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 a classic book on, on the relationship between um, imagination and uh, social institutions. For example, political institutions dealing with climate change, uh, which is uh, Castoriadis' uh, 1975. Uh, at least the French version. It's also available in in, a, in a, an American translation uh, called "The Imaginary Institution of Society," mm -hmm. um, because that deals exactly also with with uh, you know with the imaginary in this uh, rather open-ended. Uh, version that you're trying to explore so, so take a look and see uh, you know we, we, can, we can meet once we can meet again in the DS building we can discuss uh, that'd be great yeah and again my coming from a, a literature background I'm only more recently got um, more in depth in, in this idea of the imaginary and it's more sociological context and so that yeah that's great I appreciate it so but thank you again for a, for a great talk thank you very much thanks for the question have to unmute myself. So Angela, you have a question as well or comment? Yes. Hi. Um, thank you for a fascinating talk. This is the first time I'm hearing um, this type of seminar. So I'm, it's eye opening for me. I work on um, social sciences and, and quantitative research. And so I've never thought of literature from what you're describing. My question to you is, um, can you give us an example of historically someone who looked in the future, which is now or our history, have done something similar that you've done so that you're doing so i'm thinking maybe you know climate change is our future what about uh, world wars or slavery or something that's happened in in our history but the future of the past people if you understand what i'm um, saying yeah i think so <laughs> um well I, I think for writers of science fiction, they tend to stress how, you know, for all the um, credit they often get for being prognosticators or, you know, um, being able to sort of predict the future, so much of them will say that really what they're doing is either looking at ongoing social trends that already exist and they sort of just turn the dial up a little bit. Um, or in, in other cases, they, they actually see science fiction as being very much engaged with, with history. Um, so I, I mentioned Parable of the Sower, which is a book that came out in 93, um, and in that novel, uh, Octavia Butler is writing about a, a, um, a U.S. that's basically a failed state, and um, you have the rise of slavery again, and human chattel, and that sort of thing. And as the novel is at pains to make clear, it's not something that is a creation of the future, right, when the, when the government collapsed and slavery comes back, but she says that, you know, um, it's sort of always existed, right? Obviously in the U.S. there's um, the obvious case, but it's, it's always been on the fringes even if it's been ignored. So um, it's not necessarily an invention of the future, it's just something that um, comes and goes sort of cyclically, if that makes sense. So I don't know if that answers your question in, in particular, but um, I would say it's important to look at science fiction as very much based on just understanding history, if that makes sense. Yes, thank you. Uh, so I don't know, Keith. Uh, you wrote something in the chat. Was that a question to Brian, or if uh, uh, I suggest you 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 ask it now? 
a lot of fictional writers and things like that. But a lot of times people, there's like these tropes are the, there's this inherent pessimism about the future a lot of times. And sometimes I think about what I used to, so if you read from like the golden age of science fiction or if you read stuff that was written in the, you know, 50s or 60s, more in the 50s, um, that there's more of this positive attitude, but there's also some other stuff tied up with that, those notions about mm -hmm. the future. Um, and so it's, and I feel like in a lot of ways, there's like, we're, what, when, when, we're, when people produce fiction nowadays, and a lot of times, there is so much of this, you know, pessimism about what we failed to do, uh, failure mm -hmm. of imagination, a failure to take action. Yeah. And so this kind of creates this kind of pessimistic view of a future that is much harsher or much more bleak. And it, in a lot of ways, it counts um, humans short. People are incredibly adaptive. Mm -hmm. And we are able to do a lot of things in very hard situations. Um, and a lot of times, if we're coming from it, like, for example, if I'm from like a privileged perspective from the first world, a lot of times you might, I might say, oh, that person has a hard life, or that person's struggling, or that person is, um, you know, a victim in some sense and deserves some sort of sympathy or pity. But if you look at that person from their perspective, um, they're actually very resilient and they're actually making progress. And we might not necessarily notice how they're making that progress, and how they're actually succeeding, given the resource constraints that they have. Um, mm -hmm. So there's like this way that, and I feel like in a lot of ways, um, there's this anti-humanist perspective that can permeate things. Mm -hmm. And that can, in, and if we, that permeates into our fictional narratives, People, especially young people that are going to adopt it, are going to adopt a pessimistic view about how, and then, and then maybe a defeatist view, and thus they're not going to become as engaged, or they're not going to be motivated to do the changes that are necessary, mm -hmm. um, and things like that. Uh, is if we if we overemphasize these kind of anti-humanist perspectives. Um, I, one thing I found kind of interesting uh, through this talk was how does, like, I think about books like their nonfiction, like Silent Spring or yeah. Unsafe at Any Speed, and how those affected uh, public sentiments, sentiments um, yeah. because they actually influenced people who had kind of um, political influence in a lot of ways. Yeah. Uh, but if we think about the problem of climate change, there's this issue of intertemporality. And so the, the generation that is in political power right now, who's at, being asked to make uh, material sacrifices and invest in the future, are not necessarily the people that are going to bear the costs. So if you write literature about this, how do, how do we influence those people that are, when the costs of climate change are less salient. Does that make sense? I think so. Yeah. And I mean, it's very salient points. Um, because we're targeting younger people who are going to bear the cost. They're the people that are consuming it. They're the people yeah. that are stepping into these, into this fiction and then consuming this media. But we're yeah. not necessarily, you know, influencing the people that have agency now to change the trajectory into the yeah, I mean, it's a tough question, obviously, and I think it gets to, you're right when you identify, um, you know, the younger people who are more interested in this, and that's what that survey also found, is that readers of climate fiction tend to be, you know, over half of them are younger than uh, 34, so I mean, they're like the millennial generation, you know? Well, are, like, millennials are, in, that, that's going into Gen Z, so we're yeah. millennials, and it's like, ugh. But um, I'm marching. <laughs> it's a it's a yeah it's a tough question. I, Bruno Latour wrote on this recently, uh, and it makes the claim that essentially you know the the powers that be, for lack of a better word, have sort of encouraged people to 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 think of themselves as inhabiting different planets entirely, right? That the that it they have a, a vested interest in convincing people that climate change won't affect them. Um, meanwhile, of course, the wealthiest people, Jeff Bezos and otherwise, are very aware of climate change and, in fact, are taking personal actions to protect themselves. Um, so you can see how it's a sort of disparity in, in messaging versus personal action on the other side of the uh, socioeconomic spectrum. But. So is this actually oh, potentially... Thought, uh, oh, go ahead. 
I think I think we have a couple of more people and only like very few minutes left. So I think this you will have to continue. You, you could well, continue luckily our, our offices are uh, close to each other, so we can always talk. About it. Exactly. I thought you will have plenty of time to talk about. So I have two people on my list. So Anita and Ella. So I suggest you make uh, after each other one. I mean, short question, so we can give Brian the last word before we uh, round up the whole thing. So Anita, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and thank you so much, uh, Brian, for this really fascinating lecture and, and topic. Um, I wanted to ask if you can elaborate a little bit more on the narrative method that you mentioned only very briefly in the beginning and how you wanted to use that method in combination with a more sociological approach. So are you staying more on this level of, um, you know, like master narratives um, or are you like using the narrative method to talk about the narrative discourse, for instance, the mode of narration, um, these kind of aspects. And also, of yeah. course, maybe that is related to the question of genre also, because mm -hmm. I wonder to what extent this is kind of popular fiction and genre fiction that you're looking at, or if these texts have a, a little bit more of a literary feel to them, like Octavia Butler, I'm assuming, has, like, has, a, has a higher, I don't know, I don't want to talk in higher or lower, but, you know, yeah. different appeal to these texts. So, thank you. Yeah, um, I think the narrative method question is important, and I think when I talk about narrative method, I guess I am kind of referring to, um, yeah, questions of genre and the way that um, science fiction texts are basically structured in the way they present narrators. And um, I had previously a lot of extra slides that I cut out for time, but there's so much evidence of sociologists who understand science fiction as being essentially sociological along the lines of what I'm talking about in its presentation of um, emphasis on like description, emphasis on demographic ordering, uh, emphasis on the connection of individuals as part of larger groups. So when people travel to other planets, it's like discovering the society and then they just like, they literally do. And in fact, in a lot of science fiction, um, like William Gibson does this in, in his bridge trilogy from the early nineties, they actually have like ethnographers who appear in the stories and then they just like literally like, you know, describe things sociologically. And it's just like literally just spilling, you know, gut, uh, spilling their guts to the reader. Um, so I think, yeah, I think in, in a lot of ways they present themselves and they structure themselves narrative logically. It's, it's very much tied to sociology in that sense. Um, um, but yes, I hope that answers your question. So the very last question, Ella, and uh, then Brian get the last um, it was it's, it's a very quick comment rather than a question, but, um, but thank you, uh, first of all. It was really, really interesting. And I couldn't stop thinking about this recent news that basically we are running towards um, global famine really as a consequence of coronavirus and actually this future may not be so distant really and you know the implications of the, of the global famine on, on migration really. Mm. Yeah so I, the, sorry was there a question I, I think I... I well, there, isn't, there isn't a question but obviously if you if you want to respond I would love to hear what you think. Yeah I mean and that's the, I think that's the interesting thing about and actually a lot of people who are more critical of, of climate fiction they point out that um, like uh, Amitav Ghosh actually is very critical of climate fiction because he says by placing these stories in the future it really makes people think that it is like not happening now and he says that's a limitation um, and a danger to it because it is obviously already happening and so it, there actually is no breathing room we're already out of air you know to use that metaphor um, though of course I think so much of these stories are so tied to the present, um, as I've kind of suggested, and to history that I think they still do lend themselves to people thinking in more presentist terms, though what you raise is, is often um, a criticism of the genre, just to add to that, yeah. Thank you. So, uh, the list is up and I think the time is up as well. So I think on, uh, I want to say thank you to Brian and uh, suggest we all give him as a hand in our uh, Corona virtual offices <laughs> and thank him for the lecture today. So thank you, Brian. It was uh, really interesting and a pleasure. Thank you. And thank you everyone for coming. I really appreciate the comments and yeah, hope to chat with you all soon. Okay. Yeah. Bye-bye.